Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral medicine series. This video is going to be focusing on steroids and adrenal insufficiency. So what is a steroid? Well, it's a hormone, which is a signaling molecule or messenger that travels to other parts of the body. And it's derived from cholesterol. And cholesterol is a waxy substance. And you can see that sterol is related to steroid. So this is the steroid core. It contains four aromatic rings labeled A, B, C, and D from left to right here. And this is something that cholesterol has and all steroids have as well. Now steroids are secreted by a steroid gland. This could be the adrenal cortex, the testes, the ovaries, or a placenta. So corticosteroids are the first category, and we talked about these in the last video for treatment of COPD and asthma. But these are naturally produced by the body as well. Cortico refers to the adrenal cortex, which is where they're secreted from. So first we have glucocorticosteroids, or glucocorticoids for short. The main one is cortisol, which suppresses the immune system. So cortisone and prednisone are the synthetic forms and are anti-inflammatory agents or immunosuppressants used to, to help with swelling, rashes, asthma, or chronic bronchitis. There are also others like triamcinolone and dexamethasone. And then we have the mineralocorticoids. The main one is aldosterone, which helps regulate blood pressure through salt and water balance and regulation. The sex steroids are the second category, and these are secreted by the sex organs. First we have progestogens, which progesterone is the main one, which regulates cyclical changes in the endometrium of the uterus and maintains a pregnancy. For androgens, the main one is testosterone, which contributes to the development and maintenance of male secondary sex characteristics like facial or body hair and a deep voice. And for estrogens, estradiol is the main one, which contributes to the development and maintenance of the female secondary sex characteristics. But our big focus from here on out will be this first subcategory, the glucocorticoids. So Cushing syndrome is all about cortisol levels that are too high, and this could be for any number of reasons. The first category of reasons would be an endogenous source. This means something within the body itself is malfunctioning, like a benign tumor that is overproducing a certain hormone. So if it's primary in origin, that means we're getting too much cortisol directly from the adrenal cortex. So primary Cushing syndrome from an endogenous source would be blaming the adrenal cortex. Now we could go one step back in this pathway and the secondary endogenous source would be the anterior pituitary gland, which secretes adrenocorticotropic hormone. This is also called a true Cushing's disease. So if we have too much ACTH, that's going to cause the adrenal cortex to in turn produce too much cortisol. And then lastly, if we have a tertiary endogenous origin, that means that the hypothalamus is making too much CRH, which is corticotropin releasing hormone. So if the hypothalamus is producing too much CRH, that's gonna make in turn the anterior pituitary make too much ACTH, which is gonna make the adrenal cortex make too much cortisol. So you can see how you can influence the pathway one step back each time to get from primary to secondary to tertiary. But Cushing syndrome can also be caused by an exogenous source. This would be due to taking too many chronic glucocorticoids like prednisone for asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, eczema, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, or any other autoimmune disease. 
and this is the most common form of Cushing's syndrome. It's also called Cushingoid. So long-term corticosteroid use can cause the adrenal glands to stop producing the hormone cortisol naturally. And then if you stop your corticosteroid use, it may take some time for the body to start making cortisol again at a normal rate. So there's this vulnerable state of adrenal cortex suppression if the patient was taking chronic corticosteroids and then no longer is. And we'll talk more about the specifics of adrenal crisis later on in the video. So this here is the rule of twos, and it's as follows. If the patient has taken 20 milligrams of exogenous cortisol for at least two weeks within the last two years, you should be suspicious for suppression of adrenal cortex function and possible adrenal crisis. So that's a good rule to follow if you see exogenous cortisol, prednisone, cortisone, or any other glucocorticoid in the patient's patient box. One important thing to know is prednisone is four times more potent than exogenous cortisol, which is usually administered as hydrocortisone, which means that five milligrams of prednisone is equivalent to 20 milligrams of cortisol. And dexamethasone is six times more potent than prednisone. So 0.75 milligrams of dexamethasone is equivalent to 20 milligrams of cortisol. So don't get tripped up on that if they throw in one of those other drugs into a patient box. You don't need 20 milligrams of dexamethasone. You only need 0.75 milligrams to line up with the rule of twos. So what are some symptoms of Cushing's syndrome? This could be exogenous, which is the most common, or it could be endogenous. The most common would be moon facies, a round, red, and full face, and buffalo hump, a collection of fat between the shoulders. You also tend to see central obesity, a protruding abdomen, and relatively thin extremities, hypertension and hypercalcemia, as well as mood changes and chronic tiredness. Again, all of this is due to too much cortisol. And where we can have too much cortisol, we can also have too little cortisol in the case of Addison's disease, also known as adrenal insufficiency. So again, we can have an endogenous source. This would be due to immune-mediated destruction of body tissue. And once again, we could have a primary source where the adrenal cortex is simply not producing enough cortisol. And in that case, usually ACTH is increased in order to help compensate for that. We can also have a secondary source where the anterior pituitary is not making enough ACTH. And then in turn, the adrenal cortex doesn't produce enough cortisol. And once again, the hypothalamus would be to blame for a tertiary source where it's not making enough CRH, which affects these downstream targets. Symptoms of Addison's disease. The main one to know would be hyperpigmentation. This usually manifests as bronzing of the skin and brown macular pigmentations on the lips and mucosa, sort of like you'd see with putz jaggers syndrome. The patient would also be potentially immunocompromised with too little cortisol, they would be fatigued, have muscle weakness, and unexplained weight loss. So medical emergencies are a big part of the new board exam. So of course, we need to talk about Addisonian crisis, aka acute adrenal insufficiency or adrenal crisis. And this happens when corticosteroid levels in the body are critically low. So how does it happen? Well, a primary reason would be uncontrolled Addison's disease or autoimmune destruction of the adrenal gland, particularly the adrenal cortex, where those corticosteroids like cortisol are produced. Now, a secondary source would be atrophy of this adrenal cortex due to constant inhibition from exogenous steroids, which we talked about just a few slides ago. So you took corticosteroids for a while, but you're not anymore 
and the adrenal cortex is not used to having to make any cortisol. In either case, injury to the pituitary or adrenal glands, or sudden withdrawal of steroids after prolonged use, you want to consider supplementation with steroids to avoid a crisis where the body is unable to respond to stress appropriately and then goes into shock. We'll talk more about supplementation in the next slide on dental management of these patients. Now, what does it look like? Well, the patient experiences stress and then can't handle it properly due to a lack of corticosteroids, leading to hypotension, vomiting, and possible hypovolemic shock, which can be life-threatening. And lastly, what do we do about it? Well, we would activate EMS, call 911. We could apply some cool, wet, or ice packs, monitor vital signs, and in that case, we're looking out for hypotension. We would start an IV saline solution to help with the hypovolemia and inject IV hydrocortisone to help with the fact that the corticosteroids are critically low. So in terms of patient considerations for adrenal insufficiency, our primary goal is to prevent an Addisonian crisis. So we want to avoid any potential precipitating factors. Like with asthma, we want to reduce stress with good communication, short-acting benzo and or nitrous oxide as needed, and routine local anesthetic with epinephrine is absolutely allowed and recommended for a patient with Addison's disease or Cushing's syndrome. General anesthesia, on the other hand, is generally contraindicated because it increases glucocorticoid demand and could render an adrenal insufficient patient susceptible to adrenal crisis. We want to minimize blood loss if possible and monitor blood pressure throughout any stressful procedure. And we're watching to make sure the blood pressure doesn't get too low because hypotension is one of the main signs of adrenal crisis like we just talked about. Specifically, if the blood pressure drops below 100 over 60, consider fluid replacement or steroid supplementation as you are able. You can also drop the patient to a full supine position if the patient falls into hypotension. There's also a short list of medications we want to avoid because they either induce the metabolism of cortisol or inhibit cortisol production. Either way, reducing the body's corticosteroid levels, which could push them towards adrenal crisis. Phenobarbital is a barbiturate, Midazolam is a specific benzodiazepine. Phenytoin is an anticonvulsant. Rifampicin or rifampin is an antibiotic used for tuberculosis. Ketoconazole and fluconazole are antifungals. Imipramine is an antidepressant. And lastly, etomidate is a general anesthetic. If the patient is already taking one of those medications for some reason, you would want to consult with the prescribing physician before recommending discontinuing them prior to a dental surgery. And lastly, adequate steroid supplementation is an important thing. The best way to treat a medical emergency is to prevent it from happening. And one way to make sure someone doesn't get low on corticosteroids is to give them some. Now, routine dentistry doesn't require any, but a stressful surgery would require a preoperative dose and possibly a postoperative dose as well, depending on the intensity of the surgery. As always, I would reschedule, defer and refer, if the patient is showing symptoms, symptoms of an adrenal crisis or uncontrolled or undiagnosed adrenal insufficiency. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching everyone. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and consider subscribing to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons here for all of your support. You can unlock things like access to my video slides if you wanna take notes on them and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.